Right, let's start off with a quick recap of the evolution of the internet over the last 40, 30, 40 years. So we'll start off with the 1990s. 1990s was the decade of dial-up, that's when Zen launched 28.8 kilobits per second courier US robotics modems and hardly anybody used the internet. The 2000s decade was a decade of ADSL, asymmetric digital subscriber line, and the internet became a thing. 2010 was the decade of fiber to the cabinet. Fiber to the cabinet became the dominant technology in the 2010s decade, and this decade is the decade of full fiber. Now, unlike the previous three decades, the decade of full fiber is the last major infrastructure build in our lifetimes, because once the fiber's in the ground, you can go faster and faster, unlimited upgrades, by just changing the lasers and the electronics at each end. And of course, lots of people realized that it was the last infrastructure build, and if they wanted to be an infrastructure player, they needed to get a move on and start building, otherwise they're gonna miss the boat. And a lot of players did get on that boat and they did chance their luck in the great Altnet Gamble. So the great Altnet Gamble had three, per three outcomes for the players and the first two outcomes were good and the third outcome was bad. So, first outcome, get big. Second outcome, get bought. And in fact, the best outcome is do both of those, get big and then get bought for a lot more than the investors put in in the first place. And the third outcome, get stranded. What do I mean by get stranded? I mean build a network, get overbuilt by your competitors, and you end up with a situation that you're never going to get enough market share to make a viable business, never mind give a return to your investors. Actually, I think there's a fourth um, possible outcome there, which is be a niche rural player forever. <laughs> so we'll talk about that a bit later. So lots of people on the boat taking the gamble. Go back three or four years, it really felt like a gold rush, the full fiber gold rush with lots of players building as fast as they can and hoping for a big reward at the end. And back then, the business model seemed pretty simple. It was get some funding, build some network, fill it up with some paying customers, either with your own retail ISP or with wholesale partners or a combination of both, race as fast as you can to the goal. Now, wind forward to the last couple of years and things seem to have got a lot more complicated for a lot more of the players. And that's why it doesn't really feel to me like a gold rush anymore. It feels more like the wacky races, which is hence the title of my presentation. So let's just dive into some of those complexities that have sort of bubbled up to the surface in the last couple of years. And the first one is the dilemma between building and filling your network up with paying customers. So wind back three or four years, you, the focus was definitely on build network, build as fast as you can. We can worry about the customers later. Whereas in recent times, there's been a big shift in the industry to, to filling up the network with paying customers. Um, quite a lot of the players have sl really slowed down their build. Some have stopped the build altogether. Next dilemma is build versus acquire. So how best to grow the network? And what we're seeing in the market now is the guys that really want to be as big as they can possibly be are doing a combination of this acquisition and build. Of course, for a lot of the players, there's also the question about what about being acquired? And that's the end goal for a lot of the pay players in the market at the moment. When's that going to happen? Who's going to buy us? How are we going to get the most value? Will we actually make a return? Is it about cutting our losses? 
And then there's merging, which is round about the same thing. It's, it's consolidation in the market. So a question on a lot of the Altnet's lips at the moment is where will we fit into the big consolidation and when? Next dilemma up is the retail ISP dilemma. So wholesale versus retail. A lot of the builders at the moment, their core business is building network. Their core business is not running a retail ISP. Look, running a retail ISP, I've been doing it for nearly 30 years now, and it's a very involved business. It takes lots of time, lots of investment, lots of money, lots of refinement to do it well. And it's not just providing the broadband services, but it's providing those add-on services like digital voice, and it's complying with regulatory requirements, and in particular recently, one-touch switching, which has consumed the majority of our quite sizable software team for months. Now, these are all distractions that a business whose core business is building network, really they don't want. But in fact, many of the altnets, they've been forced to run a retail ISP, whether they want to or not, because unless they have a anchor sponsor that will be a wholesale customer from day one, no one, no one independent is going to sign up to a network that's not yet being built. So they've had to um, build these retail ISPs so they can start adding customers onto the network, get to a scale that they can then have a viable wholesale proposition. And finally, there's the issue of um, when altnets who's, who are wholesale have acquisition as part of their strategy, then they're going to acquire altnets that have got retail ISPs bolted on to them. And a really good recent example was the City Fiber takeover, acquisition of Lit Fiber. Lit Fiber had a retail ISP. And in the City Fiber press release that went out, City Fiber was really clear. As a wholesale only operator, City Fiber will explore options for the retail ISP following the integration of the networks. So making it really clear that running a retail ISP is not part of their strategy. Now this picture is me and Greg checking out the building Rochdale. Greg didn't actually say this to me on that particular outing, but I like the photo. Um, next, big dilemma, the threat of overbuilding. Of course, this is massive in the altnet world. So most Altnet business plans, when they were created, made an assumption that maybe a third of premises passed would turn into paying customers. And that's certainly the experience that, for example, GigaClear had in the early days building to rural communities. They were getting a penetration of about one in three, but of course they had a captive market. Um, between the Altnets themselves, there's a lot of work to make sure that they don't overbuild each other. They've almost made a pact that we will not overbuild each other because we're just diluting value. And in fact, one altnet said to me, overbuild is a cardinal sin. That's from the CEO of one of the altnets. Now, in terms of what makes a business model fly, I've talked to a number of CEOs of a number of altnets, and the lowest figure I've got is 13% market penetration. That's the break-even point. Any less than that, the business model's not going to fly. So fine between the altnets, but of course, OpenReach have very publicly said, we will build everywhere. And as soon as OpenReach overbuild, are you going to get to that 13%, up to that 33% or 30 to 40%? Big, big challenge there. And then the final point is obviously the cost of debt. A lot of these business plans were put together in the days of much lower interest rates. In the last couple of years, interest rates have soared up. All the outlets have big debt piles, and so the cost, the increased cost of that debt is adding more pressure to the business. So those are some of the complexities that have arisen over the last couple of years. Let's have a look at the players now, and starting with OpenReach. OpenReach get their own slide because they're in pole position 
in the race, 14 million FTTP premises passed. Today, a goal to get to 25 million by the end of December 2026. And they are going like a train. Three and a half million premises passed in the financial year that's just finished and a plan to build four million per year for the next three years to get to their target. But they're not gonna stop. What they've said is beyond getting that to that target, they're gonna build a million a year until they are everywhere. That's, that's what they've said. So that's the plan from OpenReach. Let's have a look at the other players. Let's do it in a, in a race results type format. So number one, Open reach, 14 million premises is a, is a Zen partner. Um, number two, Virgin Media O2 and Next Fiber, about, about 5 million, of which about 4 million are um, Virgin Media upgrading its cable network, and about a million are Next Fiber. Next Fiber CEO Rajit Datha um, said that he will build faster than any other outlet this year, so a bold claim there, but big ambition. Number three, City Fiber, 3.8 million, also part, where Zen is partnered with City Fiber. Number four, Hyper Optic. Number five, Community Fiber. Number six, Netomnia, 900,000, around about. Number seven, GigaClear, about half a million. Number eight, Brisk, with about 490,000. Bit of a caveat that there, that there are some estimates in here and not all of these numbers are ready for service premises. And something in the news recently that Netomnia and Brisk are looking to merge. Uh, if that happens, and there is indication that might happen in the next month or two, then that would propel the merged entity to number four in the list behind City Fiber. Let's talk about consolidation now. The big consolidation, it's been talked about for years, but actually in recent times there's been a never end, there's been a regular stream of deals being done. So we're definitely into the big consolidation, but where's it going to end up? So let's have a look into the future. Let's look into our crystal ball, the full fibre future. And I think we need to look forward to 2030, the end of the decade, because look, consolidating businesses is a complicated business. Business, you, not just joining the networks together, but the business, the systems, of course, you've got to join. I mean, it's a, it's a big and complex thing. So let's look forward to 2030. If we look today, there are about 25 scale players in the market today. And by scale players, I picked a somewhat arbitrary number of at least 100,000 premises passed today. Everyone thinks there'll be less than 25, but where will we end up in 2030? And at this point, I want to have a bit of audience participation to get the collective sentiment of everyone listening to this and see if together we can predict the future. So you've got four options. Will it be A, just two or three players in the market, big consolidation? Will it be B, Four to six players, will it be C, seven to 10 players, or will it be D, more than 10 full fiber infrastructure players in the market? So, everyone who thinks there'll be just two or three players in 2030, raise your hand. Okay, there's a, yeah, there's a few there. What about four to six? Four, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, that's, looking, that's looking promising. Seven to 10, uh, a, a few less, more than 10. No, oh, one, I think we've got one, one or two, one or two. Okay, well, that's interesting because um, my own view on this is, is that actually the answer is four to six, so open reach definitely, VMO2 and Next Fiber plus a few bolt-ons, I think will be there, and I think there'll be two, maybe three, big market competitors by 2030. I think as we go into the 2030s, there'll be further appetite to consolidate more, so the answer ends up with A, if the Competition and Markets Authority let that happen. Let's, um, let's go to the next audience particip participation question. This is about the niche rural broadband players, and the question is, 
Will niche rural players survive? So what do you all think? Have a think about that. Niche rural players over the next five, six, seven, eight years. Have they got a future? Everyone who thinks niche rural players have got a future, raise your hands. Okay. And everyone who thinks niche rural players haven't got a future, raise your hands. <sighs> oh, <laughs> I would say I, it's, it's pretty well balanced. Probably 60%, 55, 60%. Say they've got a future, maybe 40, 40%, 45% say they haven't got a future. Look, I nearly didn't put this slide in because this is quite, it's quite emotional for me. Because I, I, I think the niche rural players are brilliant, they're doing a brilliant job. And I sort of want them to, I want them to sustain forever. And I think as long as they have a captive market, they're the only game in town, they can continue to have a, a viable business model and continue to deliver that much needed connectivity into rural communities. But I'm, I go back to what Clive said earlier, open reach will build everywhere. And if that is literally true, and over time a substantial amount of those rural networks is overbuilt, then those rural alt-nets are going to be competing with BT Retail, Sky, TalkTalk, Talk, Vodafone, Zen and a load of other ISPs, yes, they'll have an established base, but over time, I can't help but think that base will dwindle over time. So it's with, it with, it's with a bit of a heavy heart that, that my own view is no long term. That's not to say there isn't a route for those rural ISPs, but I think the competition will, um, you know, will be a clincher. Um, I do think that on the plus side, if you, you want to have a pl plus side, is that if open reach does overbuild, the consumers in those rural communities will have a lot more choice. So, you know, that is a, a positive. Anyway, thanks for, you, thanks for your votes. So, last slide that I'm going to put up. With all this change in the market, there must come opportunity. You know, this, the saying goes, with change comes opportunity. So, I want to finish off by looking at well, what are the opportunities for Zen by all this change, by all, all this, um, you know, the, the whole wacky races thing? And Zen at the moment partners with two uh, infrastructure providers. One is OpenReach, the other one is City Fiber, and we are actively exploring the possibility of partnering with others. So if you're an Altnet listening to this, please come and have a chat with us. In fact, more specifically, please come and have a chat with Dave Barber, our strategy director, who just happens to be sitting in the third row there, um, and we can have a good discussion. So that is everything from me. I hope you found that enjoyable. I hope you found it interesting. And thank you for listening.